So, uh, from this week onward, and we will look at the um, uh, book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and uh, that's the Hall of Fame of People of Faith, okay? So, it's a new series, Only by Faith. Today is the, uh, uh, the week number one. Uh, its title is The Nature of Faith. How would you, how would you define faith? In, uh, in terms of Christianity. It's, uh, there's so many different people try to uh, define what is faith, you know? Uh, and, and some says it's a human response, human positive response, actually, to God's revelation, God's word. Rema word is being revealed, and uh, when it's, you know, open in our heart, and somewhere in your heart that you made a positive response. Yes, that is somehow sounds so right. Yes, Lord, amen. I want that to be my life. Yes, Lord, that I agree. That is the truth. Okay? And um, so we're going to have a very uh, closer look what the scripture says about faith. So, uh, what is faith? So, let's read from verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Two elements right there. You know, just this chapter starts off with the um, definition, you know, understanding of faith. What is faith? Faith is the substance. The, uh, the Greek word, that substance, it can be translated in different ways. Things like being, uh, it's a realization of something. It becomes being sure of something that you hoped for. It's a sense of you, you hope for something and it becomes reality. So always faith to do with something that hasn't happened yet in terms of future tense. But because of your faith, you hold on until that becomes a reality. And then you know that this is uh, 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 that substance, things that you used to, uh, you've been in a hope for. And also the evidence or the proof of things not seen. It's not necessarily something of the future, but you just in the realms of unseen world. Do you, we all know that your, your eyesight has limitation. We can only see what we can see, light uh, particle reflect and things, and we see. But we cannot see the things in that lies in the spiritual realm, right? You cannot see things that happen in the past, okay? But faith is the one that connects us to the realm that are unseen. But the faith is the conduit of things that, that has happened in the past, and yet that past thing is still relevant only by faith. For instance, around 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus Christ died on that cross in Jerusalem. But by faith, you know that he died for your sin. He died for all mankind's sin. By faith, that thing can be an evidence still relevant in your life. Or by faith, it shows that uh, things that you don't see and yet you know and you believe. God is invisible. And yet you know that he is real. He's there. So uh, another important word is here, verse 2. For by it, meaning faith, the elders. Uh, it's not just the uh, elders as a, you know, elders of the church. You know, those people in the past, you know, those uh, men and women of faith. The elders obtain a good testimony. Can you say the word testimony? Or report, 
more modern term will be a, some sort of good report. Here's the nature of a real faith is that the, when you have genuine real faith that connects with the things that hasn't happened yet, that connects with the things that you haven't seen or the, the realms of unseen world, spiritual realm and things, and that will produce good report if it is a genuine real faith. Are you with me? The real faith will produce testimony. You know, we share testimony. You know, you know, I was hanging on to the word of God and then this is what I got and so on. And same way, the true genuine people of God who has genuine faith, they produce good testimony, good report of that their faith. Because everybody can say, oh, I have a faith, I have a faith, I have a faith. But not everybody produce real genuine testimony and genuine report, okay? So this is uh, some of the example. For instance, verse 3, by faith, we understand that the world were framed or made or created by the word of God. Here's the word is that the Rema word of God, okay? You know, when you talk to the atheist in the people of the world, you say, you know, you got to believe in God. And they'll say, yeah, give me the enough sign. Give me the enough science. Give me enough proof. Then I, will be, uh, then I will believe. But the Bible says, if you believe, if you trust, then you will begin to understand. You will begin to see. Okay? So by faith is the first. By the faith, we begin to understand how this uh, a thing all works. We begin to see. I mean, have, has any of you old enough, you were there in the beginning when God created things by the word? None of us, right? No human being were there when God created the very frame of this uh, universe. But by faith that we understand why. Because that very creator, he is still living and he's still real. And he is communicating to his creation, especially the image of him, you know, human being that God is very much interested in and communicating that how he created the world from the beginning and everything. But it takes faith for us to understand and uh, how everything works. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This invisible world is the one that caused all this visible world to exist. So Greek philosophers in the past, and they examined the world. They may not use all this scientific method, but they were using their uh, logical thinking and saying that everything that is existing, it's from something. You know, let's say the, uh, some of the chairs, you know, whether it's uh, made of wood or iron, you know, what is that from? Somebody made that chair. So that material, where that, uh, you know, the wood came from, you know, the, the father wood, I don't know, you know, the, something from it and from it. When you chase after everything, whatever the very first material thing, but this philosophical question, that whatever the very first number one cause of this universe, cause and effect, cause and effect, what is that physical thing came from? It had to be coming from something nothing, something that beyond our realm, an invisible world. And that's where they concluded that whatever the things that we see, there's something has to be there before, unseen world, that's the one that produced. Because uh, basic science is that the, when you examine the uh, empty plastic, completely nothingness, you know, vacuum. And if we give lots of lots of time, like billions of years, let's say, would something suddenly pop out of completely vacuum and empty to pop up? You would think that, ah, oh, that's not likely possible just because you give a lot of time, that will just completely nothingness to something to pop up. But we know that something is there. And these things are all effects of 
previous calls. So when you go back, then you know, wow, it takes only faith to understand how everything works. And uh, so it takes faith for you to uh, know that there's a creator who created all this beautiful and and organized world, and he is still communicating uh, uh, to his creation. And, um, And here's some of the good reports and some of the examples of people of faith. So let's go to the, uh, some of the examples. Abel, first one is Abel and his sacrifice. Verse 4, by faith, <clears throat> Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice or the offering than Cain, and through which he obtained witness. That witness is the, uh, pretty much the same word, testimony. Same, you know, a good obtained report that he was righteous. God testifying of uh, his gift. And through it, he uh, being dead still speaks. So let's just uh, understand a little bit more. I mean, the first example of a person of faith receiving good report, receiving good testimony, even from God, God testifying of his gift, you know, is that um, what makes it so different? I mean, everybody's worship in, in this place. We all came with the intention of worshiping God, who is invisible. But not necessarily everybody received the good report from God. Not necessarily everybody receiving the good uh, 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 testifying. You know? Because we know even in the first place of worship, there's Cain... And Abel, Cain is the older guy, older brother, and Abel is the younger one. They both offer their offering to the Lord. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, God respected, use the word respected, uh, Abel and his offering. But God did not respect Cain and his offering. So people try to figure it out. Oh, what makes Cain's offering so defiled? What makes Abel's uh, offering so special? Well, here, uh, whoever is the author of this book of Hebrews tried to prove the point that Abel gave his offering coming out of faith, act of faith. And that means that uh, maybe Cain's offering wasn't connected with his faith. He's just doing it, I don't know, for the sake of doing. And another clue that we can see is that you cannot really detach your own lifestyle and your offering, okay? Let's say you live a very evil and filthy life, but on Sunday you wear the very nice clothes and uh, you put a makeup and nice perfumes and and uh, bring even some whatever the amount of things and you give it to the Lord and saying that the Lord will accept my offering because my offering is larger than that guy's offering. No, you cannot detach your life from your offering because God did not just reject Cain's offering. It's a Cain and his offering. You check with the Bible. So here is the person Abel. He offered to the Lord and used the word first fruit. First fruit. He gave God as the number one priority. He gave the very best. Why? Because that's been his lifestyle. That's been his heart. The Lord respected. Lord, see how he treat God and, uh, and so on. But Cain wasn't like that. And we can see why later on, how uh, uh, easily get angry and easily uh, just uh, 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 frustrated and even uh, violent to the point of his uh, innocent brother tricked them to the field when no one can see and, and stone him to death. Okay? And when it comes to the consequences of killing and he was scared of his own life and keep pleading to God and you know, in all these things. His life was not respected 
by God. He did not get the thumbs up from God. Okay? And um, what happened is this. Uh, and through it, he being dead, who's dead? Abel is dead, still speaks. His act of faith still remain memorable. His uh, offering that he made is very best effort to the Lord and still speaks. Okay? So one of the things about everything that you do, whatever you do it out of genuine faith in God and whatever you do, it will be your legacy. What sort of things will be remembered about you in eternity? Oh, I bought a house. I got a new car. You know, I found the most beautiful woman in North Court and I married her. What will be the thing that in eternity you will be remembered by? You know what? Abel is still being preached because of his offering, one offering that he gave his very best effort and his life reflecting that God is number one. God deserves everything. And that is still being taught in New Zealand in eternity also. The only thing that will be remembered and recognized in eternity in the sight of God by the angels and all these other saints is that the, everything that you did and lived according to your faith in Him and especially in His words. Amen? Everything else from 100 years from now. I'm sorry. None of us will be alive. Did I shock you? 100 years from now. I'll be gone for sure and you'll be gone. You know, don't use the artificial things and the old Iron Man thing. I don't know, but I don't know what kind of world will be in the future. None of us will be here and nobody will remember what we have done this way and that way. But the one thing in eternity in the sight of God, your testimony, your report, while you are living in this flesh and blood, that what you did according to your faith in amazing word of God, that will be there as a good report and it will receive reward that will last for eternity. Amen? So I want to challenge you. Which part of your life will be considered that one, at least I can say, that I've done it in faith and I have received this good report from God. Even God testifies, this is good. This Abel's offering is good. And still, that one action of offering that was made by Abel still testifies, still speaks. Okay? And, um, and here's another person named Enoch. And this is another example of people of the ancient who received this good report because they act, they live according to their faith. So, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken away. The literal meaning is that someone, he was just teleported or transported so that he did not see dead. He did not experience the physical dead. Well, would that be the first rapture case, you know, prototype? Okay, how many of you believe that uh, when Christ returned and you know, he's going to call his people and, uh, and they will not experience physical dead? Even if we are dead, we will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye and we will, be, we will meet the Lord in the air. But for those who are living, and we will transform in a twinkling of, of an eye and we'll be with the Lord. We call it a haparcho, which is the, um, the word uh, rapture, English word. Taken away, snatched away. So Enoch, it happened. And was not found, and because... Not because of some, you know, uh, 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 other stuff or aliens or all these weird ideas, because simply God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. Once again, what was happened? He had this testimony. He had this, Enoch had this report that he 
pleased God. Let me ask you, how many years that this Enoch pleased the Lord? Can you, can you guess how many years? You know, if I give you a little bit of clue, back in those days before pre-flood world, people lived long, long time, close to thousand years, close to, you know, uh, 900, 800, 800 years easily. But he lived a total of six, uh, 365 years. And uh, out of the 600, I mean, 365 years, how many years did he actually live his life so pleasing to God? It's a Bible quiz. You look like, don't look at me, Pastor. You says me like that. Well, it's just uh, 300 years. He lived in a way that pleasing God for 300 years. Oh my gosh. 300 years? Certainly none of us are 300 years. And he lived 300 years. What happened to that previous 300 years? 65 years. What happened to him? And he, I don't know, he did not have this testimony from God that he pleased God. But something happened. So you are curious. What made him suddenly change when he was 65 years old? Suddenly he began to live for God, pleasing God. And then you look at the genealogy, you look at the, all these family trees and so on, and that was the year that he had a son named uh, Medusala, who is the, you know, the, the longest living person at the time. The word Medusala is very interesting because that name is that the, upon his dead, it will burst. Interesting name. You name your son when my son is dead, something will burst. Weird name, eh? But that's the name meaning Medusala. And uh, when Medusala died, what year is that? It was the, the year that the flood came down. So people guessing that what made him so suddenly change at the age of six to five, begin to live for God and the living by faith was to do with the revelation that this son, it's like a time bomb, this son, Methuselah, when he dies, the whole world will come to an end. That sort of idea. And then he lived so closely with the Lord for 300 years. On that 300 year, the Lord so pleased and take him out of uh, the Ham's way, way before the uh, uh, flood. But the, the main thing is that the, he received the testimony. He received the report from God. This guy, Enoch, pleases my heart. And here comes the very famous scripture, verse 6. So can we just read that, you know, the uh, yellow highlighted part? Let's read it together, uh, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Amen. you got to understand this. How many of you want to live a life that is pleasing to God? Get a, a, a credit from our Heavenly Father. Maybe three people, four people. Yeah, I'd like to please Him. Uh, you know, I don't want to upset Him all the time. You know that? That you can upset Heavenly Father? You see in the Old Testament Bible, God was so, his, his uh, wrath was aroused so much. You know, you don't want to see your God in heaven so upset, all right? Because he can be. But also, he can be so impressed. He can be so pleased. But one way is that there is not possible without your faith in him, invisible God, and his word, it is impossible. To please him. So what do you need to believe when you live, if you want to live like Enoch, if you want to live like those people who have good report from God? Is that the for he who comes to God, you can change to like for he who lives or he who worship the Lord must believe. It is the must that he is God exists. You can see some people 
going through worship and prayer and everything. It's like, okay, so boring, okay. Since I'm here, I'll just sing because others are singing. Oh, that's a little bit off note. And uh, wow, look at that, guys, you know, here and over there. Or just your minds are all spread. But you're going through the worship. You may be a good singer and so on, but your heart is not in it. But if you really in the uh, a bit, uh, a, a worship, you got to know that God is watching. He is here. Two or three people gather in my name. I am there. Jesus said, He is here. He is here. Do you believe that? Jesus is here. God is here. How often do you realize that God is with you all the time? Without the sense of I live in the presence of God. We quickly fail, produce the bad report, our testimony. So that's the the first thing. Whoever comes to God must believe that he is here. He is with you. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you seek his face, if you seek his will, Instead of just making a quick decision on your own accord, your own calculation, you just constantly acknowledge God. Do not lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge that everything that God does and do, even if you're confident, I know the answer, I know how to get it done, but instead of that, you humble yourself, you acknowledge God. And Lord, what is your will? Lord, how do I, how do I find your path? God's going to reward you. Amen? So it takes faith to do all these things. And uh, Enoch was living his life for how long? 100 years? Wow, that's a long time. 300 years he lived. Perhaps he made some mistakes and sin and stuff, but quickly he would have repented before the Lord and washed himself with the repentance. But we need to see ourselves. We, just, we are so familiar with this scripture, so we read it casually, but we got to see it from the bottom of our heart. Do I have this attitude every moment of my life? Maybe a little bit of presence of God, a little bit of, oh, God is, yeah, God is there in the church. But as soon as you get out of the church, you know, door and so, and you're kind of saying goodbye to God. And uh, a week later, hey, hello, God again. How have you been? Did you miss me? No, Enoch lived every moment. Keep seeking the will of God. Keep uh, aware that God is everywhere. God is with them. And that pleased God. So much so that he will take him away for his fellowship in heaven. Okay? And uh, last of today's character... Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. So what was the warning about, uh, 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 warning to Noah? It's about the global judgment by water. The kind of flood and rain that they never experienced. You know, nowhere in the Bible before Noah's time, the mention of the word rain Rain is a thing that nobody believed in the days of Noah. What rain? We have this canopy of water in the sky that blocks up all these harmful UVs and everything, and that perhaps that's why all these vegetations and the animals are big and the people live so long and so forth, and then there comes a crazy man building a massive, massive ark, or you can call it a boat, and however you look at it, on a mountain... I mean, that's crazy, man. What is that for? Oh, there's going to be a massive global, oh, not global warming, global, global rain. And it will, it will devastate everybody. Uh, Second Peter says Noah is the preacher of righteousness. I thought he was building, busy building on ark. So can you imagine, you see the massive, massive structure in ancient world that somebody is building a massive boat on a, a mountaintop. 
That's the talk of the uh, pub. You know, people, you know that crazy man, Noah? Yeah, what is he doing? And everybody talk, and some of them more curious, and they pass by. They will ask, what are you doing, old man? Well, you know, and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm building this and that. See that how the conversation will go? He will pour out his passion. There will be time that God's going to wipe out the whole world with water. The water, rain will come down from heaven. This will happen definitely. Everyone laugh at them. Remember, Jesus said, what is going to be like the, uh, the end of our days? What is going to be like? What are the signs of the end time? And Jesus said, it will be just like the days of Noah. People will be busy. They're doing their own business, getting married and uh, buying a land and uh, doing this and doing that. But never pay attention to the clear warning of God. Noah, we don't know how long he's been building, but he was telling people that is coming. So he's been, uh, uh, he has received this warning uh, uh, for the things that didn't happen yet. Same way you have been warned. Amen? Jesus made it very clear. The end is near. Just because of the long patience, long suffering of God, as, uh, oh, it's not going to happen. It will happen. First world was destroyed by water, and that this world will be destroyed by fire. And uh, it will happen. Noah had this godly fear. What is the difference? Godly fear and uh, just a normal, normal fear, human level of fear. Godly fear is that the one that uh, produced the diligence, doing something about. But the uh, worldly fear is that it cripples you. You know, you've been good practicing, you know, some performance and things. But when you stand before a whole lot of people, you have this stage fright and things. And you just cannot even perform the halfway that you can do. All right? The difference is that the godly fear is the one that motivates you. To do something. In the, uh, Noah's case, he was motivated every day. He built this massive ark and prepared an ark for the savings of his uh, household. Why should live, we as a Christians live a godly life instead of enjoying, squander our time and body and money and everything just like the people of the world because we have godly fear. God will not be mocked. He will not say to so-called Christians who live such a filthy life, six days and Sundays, coming to church and singing some song, and hey, God, see you later. No, God cannot be mocked. He knows who's actually living in the godly fear, honoring God, a faith in the things that has not happened yet. But Noah lived that sort of life. And by which he commended the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. He received the rhema word of God. The world will come to an end, prepare a ark that will save you and your family. It took many years, I bet, and he prepared the whole thing diligently, motivated by godly fear, living differently than the people of the world. Let us ask ourselves, do you have faith? Do you have faith in God? Do you have faith in the Word of God? It's the one thing that we say we do, but that report that God gives, that testimony that God gives, it is not based on what we say. Enoch, it took 300 years to get a report from God. That guy truly, truly pleased me and believed me. For Noah, we don't know how long, but it took a long time. He built an ark and he keep living by the godly fear. So one thing that we say, I have faith. But it's another that we have received approval from God. We have received this testimony from God. That guy truly has faith. I am well pleased. Let us not kid ourselves. God is not like some uh, mute and dumb idol 
not knowing what you are doing, what you've been doing. But you can easily fool him if you offer some food and giving some coins and money and thinking that, oh, you will be happy with that thing. And uh -uh. Don't be like Cain. Be like Abel. You live your life. If anything you give to the Lord, give the very best, not the least or whatever. You know, Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there's your heart also. You know, you don't want to be late for your business meeting. At least you're embarrassed about. But when it comes to God, you know, we, we have completely different standards. I want to ask, not just the lip service, let's give the very best of our essence, our life to the Lord. Amen? Because He deserves. Let us reflect what we believe in our daily lives. Amen? So it takes real faith. So I want you to uh, close your eyes as we study and uh, apply this word next few weeks. I want to see the upgrade, software upgrade of your faith. And we need to be serious about it because uh, there's not much time left. Enoch lived way many hundreds of years before that judgment and he was walking with God daily. He pleased the heart of God so much that he was raptured up. How many of you want to be found by Jesus when Jesus returned? Here's my man and here's my woman of faith. But instead, Jesus said, how many will I find them faithful? In other words, how many people will I find them with genuine faith when I return to collect my own people? That database is not in the church database. That database is in the heart of God. And God knows who's really living their life according to the faith. I want you to close, uh, I want you to stand up in your place, that Lord, and I admit that Lord, and my, whatever the, uh, my faith part of my heart and my life is being very rusty and I want to renew and refresh and uh, I want to get my life sorted not as the world defines me not as the world demand me Lord but not as, but by the ray my word of God by the word of God Lord and my life needs to be reorganized. Put a proper priority. Things in right order. God being the first. Lord, increase my faith. Forgive me for my unbelief. Okay? Stand up in your place. If that's your heart, if that's your prayer, this morning I'm going to pray for you that God will upgrade your faith. God will refresh your faith. And we will live our daily life in the presence of God and knowing that God gives reward. God respect those who respect Him. Okay? Let our lives, let our activity truly respect everything what God has done. Father God, I pray for all these people who are standing up, knowing and also wanting to increase and upgrade their faith in the Lord. And I pray that, Lord, and you will work in our lives. You will sharpen us up, Lord. And let us have this eagerness and seeking for the kingdom of God in our lives, Lord. For the will of God in our lives, Lord. Not just as a lip service, but as a genuine, transformed life, Lord. We want to respect your word and respect your standard. We cannot do this on our own accord, so we need the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that the Holy Spirit, you will fill us up with your anointing, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen and amen.